and thank you for taking the time to join us for a casual and informational chat about how you can celebrate the season through the joy of giving. Uh, before we get started, please note that this presentation does not constitute an endorsement or recommendation of services by Palouse Land Trust and is presented for purely informational purposes to help you navigate the many changes to charitable giving rules this year. Any comments made by our panelists are individual opinions and don't necessar necessarily reflect the views or opinions of their respective employers. Uh, so with that, it is my pleasure to uh, welcome you all and uh, welcome our panelists. Chase? Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Chase Carlin. I work for Presnell Gage Accounting. We have offices in Pullman, Moscow and other places around here. Uh, I am a CPA. I've been with the firm for five or six years and been in the area for eight or nine years. Um, and I'm excited to be here. All right, then I'll go next. I'm Jeff Fierstein. Been uh, in Pullman since I was a uh, wide-eyed freshman in 1981 decided to stick around and uh, worked as a financial advisor here in Pullman at the Waddell and Reed office, but just on a personal level, which is more how we're representing ourselves as people that have a passion for the cause and the purpose of the Police Land Trust and for giving. It's delightful to, to be a part to try to help people make the most of their gifts and find those opportunities to make a difference with their money. And my name is Rusty Schatz. I'm over on the Moscow side. I work as a financial advisor for DA Davidson. I came up to Idaho from Wyoming uh, for college and uh, married a girl from Troy. And so the rest is kind of history. And I've been around a long time since. Um, I, uh, like Jeff, have really appreciated all that the Plus Land Trust does. And I'm very passionate about uh, their mission as well as um, the many charities that we have here in the area. I uh, really appreciate being able to work with the charities and see uh, people being able to um, give to good local organizations. Fantastic. Thank you, Chase, Jeff, and Rusty. Welcome, and we're so grateful to have you with us today. Uh, and I'm just going to kick it off with a question that I know I have been asked a few times by donors. But the CARES Act passed earlier this year had some pretty big changes in the tax code for charitable giving. Would you be able to tell me what those changes are? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, we're coming up here on the end of the year and probably the two changes that are most relevant to what people might be planning on doing between now and December 31st um, are, the first one is that the IRS um, will now allow a certain amount of charitable deductions, even if you don't itemize your taxes. So historically you needed a whole bunch of itemized deductions, including mortgage interest and property taxes, state income taxes and charitable deductions. Um, and you had to clear this big threshold of like $20,000 in some cases. Um, so now what they're doing is they're trying to encourage people to give. And so the CARES Act has allowed kind of a one-time 2020 only um, what we call above the line deduction of $300. And so basically, if you give $300 to any qualifying uh, charitable organization, you're gonna get credit for that on your taxes, even if you didn't meet um, that larger threshold that I was mentioning a second ago. So um, we're excited that the CARES Act has done this. Um, you know, $300 might not sound like a lot, but in the aggregate, it can sure add up. Um, and, you know, it's nice to know that the, the law is uh, reflecting and encouraging that kind of behavior. And so we're hoping that our clients will um, consider it if they haven't done so already. Um, the other reminded me of one thing I was gonna ask you, if you're a couple, is that $300 each? That's a great question. Um, so there was some confusion about that earlier in the year. And what we're seeing now is that it's just $300 regardless of if you're single or married. Um, the language was a little obscure at first, but the IRS has released draft forms of the Form 1040, and it looks like it's just $300 regardless of your filing status. That might change, um, but right now, the language that I'm seeing says, don't put more than $300 in that box on your return. Great question. Thanks, Jeff. That was great. And Chase, I know for some folks, uh, giving a larger gift um, might be an idea. Is there a change there if you were thinking about giving a bigger gift? 
Yes, there is one other notable change. Um, so historically, if you did break that larger threshold in order to itemize, um, you were still limited how much you could give and deduct in a single year. Um, and historically, that number was about 50 or 60% of your adjusted gross income. And what uh, the, the limits were previously trying to um, stop somebody from just completely taking all of their income in one given year and kind of messing that up. Um, but kind of like a bigger version of the $300 change, um, the CARES Act has actually increased that limitation to be, you can deduct up to 100% of your income. And so if somebody were so inclined, um, they could make a big gift. And there are a couple of restrictions about that as far as um, if the money can or can't go to donor advised funds. But in general, um, the limit is 100% now, meaning um, you could effectively get rid of all of your taxable income in a year with a large gift. And so that might be something that people would want to consider. Um, maybe not the majority of people, but the option is certainly out there. And of course, it doesn't necessarily have to be 100%, right? It could be 75%. Um, but the bottom line is, is that that cap is no longer present, at least for this year. Wow, awesome. Thank you, Chase. Um, well, aside from just writing a check or giving a, you know, a cash donation to a favorite organization, are there some other tax-friendly ways that folks can give? Jamie, I'll jump in there. Um, one thing that we talk to a lot of clients about uh, is a giving appreciated stock. And uh, for example, say a client has a taxable investment account uh, where they've had some stock that performed really well. Um, and maybe they need to rebalance their account, which would mean selling the things that are high and buying something else that's low. Uh, when you sell those high things, you'll typically incur taxes. And so one way to rebalance an account without incurring taxes is to give to your favorite charity. And uh, we worked with uh, a lot of charitable organizations, Loose Land Trust, multiple others uh, have accounts set up where you simply need to talk to your uh, financial advisor and they can help you with forms to be able to donate uh, that stock to your uh, to your favorite charity and in doing so uh, you pass that that uh, stock over to them and you get the full uh, tax benefit of, of, of the, the amount that you're giving on the date that you give it and you don't have to pay the taxes on on the the amount that it has gone up in value over time. Jamie, I think you're muted. Yeah. Oh, geez, I sure was. Hey, okay. <laughs> thank Sorry you so that. much for that. <laughs> um, so aside from stocks, anything that we should know about for retirement accounts and IRAs? Yeah, great question. You know, um, a few years ago, we had a, a pretty overarching tax bill passed, um, raising those uh, standard deductions. And uh, we saw a lot of changes in how people were giving because you had to give so much to be able to, to reach those kind of ceilings, I would call them. And so um, if you give directly from an IRA, if you're over the age now of, of uh, 72, I believe, so you're giving, a, you're, you're forced to take a required minimum distribution, um, you can give that directly to a charity of your choice and it won't be taxable. So for example, if you had to give, uh, or if you had to take $5,000 out of your IRA or 10,000 or 100,000, whatever that number is, um, you can pull out that amount, give it directly to the charity, working with your financial advisor and uh, not have to recognize taxes on that. Uh, there is a caveat, you can't give more than uh, a collective $100,000, but most of us, uh, that's not too big of an issue and, and you can definitely do a lot of giving uh, within within that realm. Excellent, um, fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, and and I guess speaking of retirement, are there other ways that people can build philanthropy into their IRA aside from just making a gift out of it? It's a great question. Um, there is another option that is out there that I think people don't consider as often as they should, and, and that's the idea of naming the beneficiary of an IRA as the charity that you're considering giving to. Um, a lot of times when people are getting uh, close to retirement or past retirement and they're getting into estate planning, um, it can be hard to tell, you know, I've got kind of three buckets of, of 
money as far as you know, all my different assets and you know, why would I want to um, do something with one that I wouldn't want to do with the other. And so when it comes to those retirement accounts, um, there's a lot of benefits to naming the charity as the beneficiary if you're planning on giving, especially if you're planning on giving anyway. Um, namely, those retirement accounts, they start having to get drawn on once they pass from the, um, the decedent onto the heir. And um, there are favorable tax treatments for things like stock portfolios where they can have their basis stepped up that don't get applied to IRAs. And so you can have a situation where um, from, the, from the giver's perspective, you're giving kind of the same amount, but you're ending up with a better tax situation by naming the beneficiary of the IRA as the charity versus just um, giving a stock portfolio or a cash gift. Um, Jeff, I know you've had experience with this. Are, are there any stories that might be helpful to share? Yeah, again, we work with people say, you know, I just love the police land trust. I'd love them to get 10,000 bucks when I die. And I'm gonna write that into my will. They say, great, let's do that. Well, it can take a while to settle the estate. And um, it's, it's a little bit messy. It's a little bit slow. If they say, you know, I love my kids, I want kids to get 10,000 as well, then they name the kids in the beneficiary in the IRA. What that means, the kids are then gonna have the taxable income. And if they just switch those two and made the police land trust the beneficiary of the IRA, they get that owing no tax. If they give that stock instead to the kids, then it gets what they call the stepped up basis or say they paid 2000 for that stock and it grew to 10, then that gets forgiven on death to individuals. So just that switch of doing that the right way can make a difference of uh, quite a few thousand bucks in taxes, even on a simple $10,000 gift. So being thoughtful on that. And I also like just the simplicity of changing a beneficiary is very easy to do versus getting around to updating your will. And are we really going to talk to the attorney, are we really gonna do all that stuff? Changing the beneficiary on the IRA is very easy, very simple to do. You know, uh, Chase and Jeff, I was um, actually thinking about that very question. And I had an example a few years ago, um, just with the messiness of an estate where someone gave a percentage of their total estate to a charitable organization Within that estate, they had a house, they had another property, and all of a sudden appraisals became a big deal and all of these things um, to get the true percentage down for these entities that were kind of corporate entities. Whereas with, a, with an IRA, it would have been really, really easy to settle for everyone. So that didn't have necessarily a tax implication, but definitely uh, for ease of settling the estate was a big deal. Yeah, and that's another good point, Rusty. You can, in your beneficiary designation, say, I want the trust to get 10% of what's in this account. Or you could say $10,000. You have that ability to give a percentage. So as your account grows, so does your charitable. Or if you've got a fixed dollar gift, you can say the charity gets this first, the rest goes to these beneficiaries. So there's quite a bit of control and flexibility you have over that that I think is helpful. That's, and, that's really great, um, all, all three of you. And I'll just add that as someone who has not gotten around to making a will yet, I have two different IRA accounts. So that is something that's much easier for me to handle than actually getting my will done probably when we're talking about time frame before the end of the year, let's just say. So for anyone else who might be in that boat, um, also a, a, just a great reminder that that's a wonderful vehicle to give philanthropically. Um, and Jeff, for donors who are thinking more strategically, like you were speaking about, about their philanthropy, can you tell me a little bit about charitable trusts? Oh, sure. Yeah, they can be a great way to release charitable benefits that frankly give you a lot in the here and now. Or one of the reasons people don't give charitably is they may not be in a position they got a ton of money in the bank or a ton of cash or free cash flow. And they say, you know, I'd love to, but all my money's tied up in this stock that is appreciated. I don't want to deal with selling it or this piece of land. Um, one key strategy that can be used is a what's called a charitable remainder trust. And I like to use a little bit of smart aleck stuff that fits this time of year and say, I think Ebenezer Scrooge would have enjoyed charitable remainder trusts. And not the last Scrooge who, you know, got, got charity in the end, but the beginning Scrooge who was counting his pennies. Um, 
because simply you can take an asset, take a piece of raw land that may have appreciated, you're getting no yield off of it effectively. And you can, but you're not wanting to sell it because it's appreciated. You can put that into a charitable trust. And while you're living, you can choose to pay yourself as much income as you want for as long as you live. And you might say, well, yeah, I'd give to charities, but I want my kids to get something. You actually even have the ability to set up two generations. You can say, well, I still want it to be for me and the next generation. Ultimately, how long or how many lives you put in there determines when the charity gets it in the end. But the simple benefit is you get a tax deduction here and now, you avoided capital gains, and you can choose to pay yourself the income that you want. If you say, I wanna pay myself five, six, 7%, you can pick the income that really benefits you and gives you a predictable income stream. So it simply allows you to put more money in your pocket while uh, keeping that last Scrooge happy who loves charity as well. And knowing that, hey, when you're gone, this money is gonna make a difference. So consider that for the benefits here and now, it can be very powerful. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Jeff. And I'm gonna open this up to, to the three of you. If um, donors are thinking about making perhaps a larger gift this holiday season, what would you offer up before they make the donation? What would you want them to think about or tell their advisor? And do you wanna go first on that, Rusty? Oh, sure, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I would uh, just wanna really look over everything um, that, that uh, um, that, that the client has, make sure and, and uh, that they meet with the advisor, they explain what they're trying to do and really um, kind of look at the, the, the big picture. Um, and, and, you know, I, I would always throw in there that uh, we give because we want to give. Make sure we're doing that first and then the tax benefit second. And as long as we're doing that, I think it all uh, really works out well. And uh, there are several different strategies as we've listed here today. And you just wanna make sure that, uh, that your advisor knows really your situation so that you can pick the right one for you. That's right, yeah. And I'd say likewise, I've had some clients who chose to make big charitable gifts through some of these charitable trusts and so on, and they've got all these big deductions. Well, those actually make you be a little bit more patient. You can only deduct a smaller percentage of your income if you've given an appreciated asset to the trust. So we were talking with someone yesterday realizing, you know, you got all these deductions that are kind of being parceled out slowly. We probably do want to trigger more taxable income. You probably want to sell some stuff, trigger some gains because you got all these deductions on the other hand. So like Chase was saying, integrate your charitable thinking with your tax planning, with your investment planning, and uh, that can help you make the best of it. And um, again, this is a unique tax year where a lot of doors are open that's unique. So now's a great time to think about um, talking with folks and, and see what difference that can make. I guess I'll just throw one more then on the pile. Um, one thing to consider that a lot of people have uh, found more attractive in the last year or two have been giving to a donor advice fund. Um, basically what this is, is it's a larger um, kind of management of charitable gifts where you can make a larger single gift to them and then over a period of time they can distribute the money to a charity or charities um, that you are interested in. And so what it helps people do is they can, for tax purposes, they can get a kind of a single one-time large gift that might get them over that threshold that they were having trouble getting over before. Um, but from the charity's perspective, the charity is kind of receiving the the stream of income that would normally be in effect if you were writing the check every single month or something like that. Um, we've seen people in situations where you know, they've already planned out how much they think that they can give for you know, the next year or even two years. And so they bring it all together into one large gift um, and they give it to a donor advised fund so that they can uh, maximize the efficiency for tax purposes. Um, so it's just something to think about. It's not the right answer for everybody, but it is um, helpful for some people. And uh, we definitely encourage it if it's the right fit. That's right. I wanted to kind of dovetail with that a little bit to the earlier comment that you made about giving from your IRA. If you're not able to itemize and you are over age 72, giving from your IRA gives you the effective benefit of a deduction and that it comes out tax-free. 
So if you're doing that donor advised fund idea, double up your donations, get above the threshold, be able to itemize that year. And then next year, when you've not giving because you've given two years worth in the donor advised fund, that's the year to pay direct from your IRA to the charity. So those two can be a good one to kind of put in, uh, in balance and alternate by years. Those, that can work well. Wow. <laughs> Gentlemen, thank you so, so much uh, for that amazing wealth of knowledge and um, just celebration of giving. And uh, I know personally and from all of us at the Land Trust, we're, we're so glad to have you in the Land Trust family and, and to have you as such wonderful supporters, not of our work only, but of all of the organizations in our communities that do such wonderful things and make this such a great place to live, work, and play. I hope for those of you watching that this panel has shed a little more light on the ins and outs of tax law and all the joys that go along with it. Again, if you have any questions or want to understand more about how this year's changes might affect you and your financial standing, please talk to your trusted financial advisor. Or if you'd like to follow up with Chase, Jeff, or Rusty, I will be uh, the, see there information will be in the video description and we can get you connected with them as well if you'd like to ask specific questions. And gentlemen, if you have any last thoughts, please go ahead. Otherwise, um, thank you so much for joining us and for sharing and have a wonderful holiday season. Thanks, Jamie. Yes, thanks. And just that basic idea that I think the best definition of wealth is that you can help somebody else with it. So whether it's a big amount or little, it's a great way to enjoy the wealth you have to see it make a difference.